I'm Stefan Greber. I work at Canon and Core. I've been doing container stuff there, uh, running the LexD project for uh, quite a few years now, eight years, something like that. And uh, used to be working with Christian over there, who's now at Microsoft. Um, what do you do? Yeah. Uh, I work as a principal software engineer, but mainly upstream. Uh, maintain a few kernel features. All right, and so in, in this one, we're gonna want to just go through kind of the state of containers in the current Linux kernel. Uh, also kind of, you know, where do we stand now? What's happened recently? What do we see happening over the next um, few months or years? It's always kind of hard to predict kind of development. Um, and do a few demos here and there of the kind of the main, the, the main aspects of container on Linux. So, um, the first thing is, you know, what's a container? That's always a bit of a weird one on Linux because there's really no such thing as a container inside of the Linux kernel, uh, despite a lot of people wanting it to be, um, yeah, there's just no such thing. Uh, so to reuse the, the words of uh, Serge Harens, that it's effectively a user-space fiction. Um, there's no such, yeah, no such concept. Now, a container is usually a set of processes um, that are part of some namespaces. Typically, we consider that you they need to at least be part of the PID namespace for it to be considered a viable container. Otherwise, those processes are not really namespaced in any useful way. Um, and there's also some conf optional confinements that we tend to put around it, whether it's things like the LSMs or Palmer's, SLNX, or the like, or SecComp, or um, capabilities, that kind of thing. Uh, there are effectively two kind of containers, at least in the way we tend to communicate that to other people. Um, one type would be a privileged container, where root inside of the container would be equal to root outside of the container. Uh, that's what's been the default for many, many people for a long time, and is unfortunately still the default in the likes of uh, Docker and Kubernetes, and there are ways around that, but yeah, by default, they're still privileged. And then you've got unprivileged containers which make use of the user namespace where root inside the, of the container is not equal to root outside of it, um, offering a lot of extra protection. And that's what we're gonna be focusing the most in this talk. We effectively consider privileged containers to be legacy and something that needs to die and go away, not something we want to really spend too much time focusing on. Um, so, just let's look at kind of the most basic uh, of containers we can we can create here. So just switching that over. Here we go. Um, so just on my laptop, saying we want to launch a say, Ubuntu 22.04 container. There we go. Uh, that's using LexD in this case, uh, which has the nice advantage of defaulting to user namespace and turning on pretty much all of the features you can suspect. Uh, so you can go in the container. Looks like a normal Linux system, everything's running. You even have things like UDEV and all of the systemd services and everything running on there as you would on any Linux system. If you look on the network side, it's got its own network card, uh, it's got its own host name. So all of the namespaces are effectively put in place there right out of the box. And if we look at what things look like from the outside, um, you see here at the bottom of the screen that the owner of the processes is actually UID 1 million outside of um, the container. So that shows the user namespace at work. Inside of the container, it looks like UID 0. Outside, it doesn't. So should something dramatic happen and the user be able to escape the container for some reason, they are effectively just a nobody user on the whole system, mitigating a lot of potential security issues. So that's kind of your container 101 and um, well, and privileged containers with user namespace effectively. All right. Um, also, yeah, that container effectively had a second policy in place uh, to filter some system calls that we just don't want to see allowed ever. Uh, it also has an Aparma policy used as, which effectively is like a path-based um, policy for, for a lot of the file system things. Um, used as kind of a last resort in case of like, should you be able to escape the container for some reason, that policy will still apply to you and might still block even more attacks. Linux bugs are a thing, um, like nobody disputes that. And occasionally some of those bugs would allow for uh, a, someone to completely bypass a container and escape it. So that's why you kind of want this, this approach of layering security features on top of security features so that even if that does happen, you can really limit the, the blast radius. Uh, but you should also be extremely careful as far as applying all security updates and making sure, yeah, everything is updated. All right. Uh, back to some, 
Yeah, so uh, I mean, one of the basic building blocks uh, most people will probably be aware of is um, a namespaces. Um, this is a kernel technology, and the namespace isolates a specific resource, usually, uh, that the kernel, uh, that usually would be global, and the namespace makes it local. Um, and uh, the most famous namespace or the namespace that we currently have are the UTS namespace that's concerned with isolating the uh, host name so that the container can have a different host name than well, the host. Uh, the PID namespace which isolates the uh, PID identifier so PID1 in the initial namespace is different from PID1 in um, another PID namespace, um, and they are hierarchical, so that means all PIDs that have a representation in one of the descendant PID namespaces will have a representation in an ancestor PID namespace, but not in a sibling PID namespace. So if you think about two PID namespace hierarchical trees, this is the root tree, PID namespace one, PID namespace, sibling PID namespace two, these one don't share any visibility into each, other pro into each other's processes, but if, you, if they fork children PID namespaces, then all of the pits in the chill child will have representation in each parent and in each parent it will be a, a different um, number. So the parent, the ancestor pit namespace can always see this is the process I want to send a signal to and kill it in one of the uh, child uh, pit namespaces. Mount namespaces isolate the mount table. Uh, so that means you can get a new, well, when you create a new mount namespace, all of the mounts uh, of the ancestor mount namespace get copied, so they're private copies, and uh, if you unmount them, usually, then you don't unmount the one, the mount, the parent mount namespace. However, there is, um, mount namespaces are like a Swiss cheese concept. You think they're private, but then you have mount propagation, which means you can have tunnels and relationships between different mounts, uh, which means if you unmount a specific mount in, um, in a child mount namespace, and that one is a shared mount, which belongs to what we call a peer group of mounts, and then all of the other peers in other mount namespaces get unmounted as well. And this is not even the complex part of it. Like, we want to talk about mount propagation, we can spend a whole uh, afternoon here uh, to figure out its semantics. So it's very, uh, it's very complicated, but um, the original reason, for example, was that you need some type of flexibility to make mounts show up in child mount namespaces or in container namespaces. So it can't just be an isolation mechanism in the same way that, for example, network namespaces, which we're going to talk about next, are. So network namespaces isolate network devices. Um, so when you clone or create a new network namespace, all of the network namespaces on the host disappear, and then you're left to figure out how to give network connectivity to your container, which you all know leads to such beautiful things as Kubernetes plugins. Uh, complex networking is, is great, right? Everybody loves it. Um, I personally, if, you, if it goes beyond VET devices, I'm out. Uh, because I don't understand it anymore, but uh, network namespace isolates routing and IP addresses and all that, uh, all that kind of stuff. It's a very powerful concept uh, for sure. And then we have IPC namespaces, which is usually the most uninteresting one, at least um, in terms of describing its functionality, just isolating uh, inter-process communication. So v 5 semaphores, IPC message queues, um, and so on. And uh, the most important one, arguably, is the user namespace, which is the only namespace that is concerned with isolating the, the privilege concepts that we have on Linux. So if you create a new user namespace and you land in a world, I'm ignoring writing ID mappings now because that's complicated as well and really not that important, but suffice it to say that if you have, if you do IDU inside of a container with a user namespace and you get reported UID zero, and then that's different from UID zero on the host. Like that UID zero in the container will be mapped to some random ID, 10,000, 100,000, whatever, um, on, on the host. And also the capability set uh, is isolated to that container, meaning if you ask, usually the kernel doesn't ask, do I have a capability globally? Uh, it asks, do I have a capability in a given user namespace, for example? And uh, this is important because all of the other namespaces have owning user namespaces. This is something which has been uh, not very uh, explicitly expressed for a very long time to the detriment of user space. But um, 
your network namespace that you usually are on on the host is owned by the initial user namespace. So if you want to perform management operations on, say, a network uh, interface, then the kernel will ask, do you have caps net admin, which is the capability that you need to administer a network namespace, in the initial user namespace? And that's usually a pretty high bar. That usually means you need to be root or you need to be executing a binary that has this specific capability set. Now, when you create a new user namespace, unshare dash dash user, uh, and then you create a new network namespace within that user namespace, what it's essentially doing is it makes that new network namespace owned by that user namespace. So if you perform network administration operations in this child network namespace, the kernel then asks, do you have capnet admin in the user namespace that owns the specific network namespace? And that sort of logic is generalized across all of the other namespaces as well. So if you unshare a user namespace first and then uh, unshare additional namespaces, they all get owned by that user namespace. Consequently, if you unshare uh, a user namespace without um, unsharing any of the other namespaces, you lose all control and privileges in those um, namespaces. So it's a pretty flexible mechanism, but again, it comes with caveats. You have beautiful uh, things such as some operations are so unsafe that the kernel cannot ask, just ask, do you have cap make not in the uh, user namespace that you're currently located in, like an unprivileged one, but it will always ask, do you have cap mac admin, uh, cap make not in the global uh, namespace? So this isolation is not necessarily um, perfect, but it's a, it's a pretty um, powerful mechanism to gain more security for your containers. I mean, it's not foolproof, right? There is a lot of functionality that is exposed uh, via user namespaces that can potentially be used to ex cause exploits, right? It's one of the biggest criticism. Like new functionality is made available inside user namespaces, but that also means you increase, you increase the attack service. But as it usually comes, people want to have ever more functionality. <laughs> and so over time, it just grows in terms of features. So that's the it's a valid criticism that you can leverage against it. But in terms of uh, container technology, this is probably one of the most important aspects, uh, user namespace. And there are some more recent namespaces that we don't need to go into um, uh, in excessive detail because they haven't been merged yet. But usually we get proposals for a new namespace every two or three years. Somebody comes up, can we add a time namespace, which we've added uh, because it uses uh, apart from uh, containers. Um, we had the IMA namespace, which is constantly being pushed. I don't know if it's ever going to make it in, but it's something that people keep thinking about. Um, and then there is stuff like bin format, uh, what is it, bin format MISC? Yeah. Bin format MISC namespacing. I wrote that patch that I should probably remember <laughs> that. But um, bin format MISC namespacing is also a thing. There is uh, usually when you want to do something nowadays, Avoiding making it a completely separate namespace that requires you to call a new clone flag, uh, because that's how namespaces are created, either during process creation or via the unshare uh, system call, and can just dangle it off another namespace, usually the user namespace, because you want to express the notion that the resource that you're delegating is owned by that user namespace, then that's the uh, preferred way of doing it. But it's a, namespaces are an interesting concept, but they're all sort of related to each other and then also orthogonal to each other that it's very difficult often for user space to work sanely with them. Yeah, and the user namespace is quite convenient for that because it already has a relationship with all of the other namespaces. It's a very convenient place to kind of dangle everything else. So whenever we need something else in the Linux kernel that needs to be namespaced, like mentioned bin format mask, we also have some potential thing we might need for tracing at some point. Uh, like on my team, we've been looking at maybe doing something for logging at some point because it's also also been a bit of a mess in in the past. For those kind of things, instead of like coming up with an entirely new namespace which is going to eat up uh, clone flags and make it like kind of difficult to reason about because you're going to have to figure out what happens if someone wants to use that namespace just on its own, it's quite a bit easier these days to just be like, well, this is going to be part of the user namespace and. Um, User namespace doesn't necessarily mean that you're running things unprivileged. You can totally make a user namespace and then actually use a privileged map inside it and effectively get you the benefit of the user namespace as far as like ownership of all the namespaces without necessarily uh, losing any kind of privilege on the system. 
All right, so just a quick demo here of um, how that stuff works. So there's a very convenient command on, on pretty much all Linux systems called unshare, um, which is a convenient wrapper around what the unshare um, system call can do. And you can use that to play with all kinds of namespaces. Uh, in this case, the version I've got supports pretty much all of them. So we've got um, mount UTS, IPC, net, PIDs, user, C group, and time. C group is the one we forgot to put on the list earlier. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, let me fix that. There you go. See, uh, there are so many namespaces that we keep forgetting what yeah. exists. <laughs> Yeah, when we're making the list, we're like, that looks a bit short. We probably missed one. And yeah, we did miss the C group namespace, which doesn't do a lot other than just say, when you unshare it, whatever C group tree you're at at the time of unshare becomes your new root of the C group tree um, for any operations after that point. So uh, yeah, the unshare command, uh, it's got flags for just about every single namespace. And where it gets kind of interesting is when you use it unprivileged. So you can do uh, user namespace, say I want a PID namespace, a net namespace, a mount namespace. Uh, I want it to remap root to myself and I want it to fork. Right, so now I'm root. I'm not real root, I'm just a root. Um, so in this case, I'm root within that new user namespace. If I do ID, it shows that, yeah, I'm root. Um, but it also shows that nothing belongs to anyone anymore because there is no actual mapping for real root inside of that namespace. Uh, but I could go and create network devices, I can go and do mounts, I can do a whole lot of stuff without ever having um, had any kind of privilege whatsoever. That unshare command is running just as me as a normal user. It didn't use any kind of set UID or any kind of other privilege escalation system um, whatsoever. So it can be used as a very useful security measure uh, because you can use that within um, like just a user session to do uh, advanced security even within an application. Web browsers have been known for doing that, uh, doing things like running different namespaces per tab or running the render uh, thread inside of a different um, namespace to make it much harder to attack. Uh, for example, like if you're running a piece of a piece of software um, that needs to spawn a, a sub process that should never be allowed to go on the network, well, you could just create an empty network namespace for it, and it won't be able to do that. Um, so you can do that kind of stuff, and it's very convenient to well, we can explore it with just the unshare command effectively. All right. So next, the LSMs. Yeah, I mean, uh, in addition to the uh, user namespace. We mentioned that there is a lot more um, <clears throat> security that you can uh, leverage to secure your container. And uh, one of the most crucial ones, probably Linux security modules. And uh, as is tradition on Linux, there isn't just one Linux security module. We have 10, or probably if you'd ask me in 10 years, we have 20. I'm joking, but we have a lot of uh, different Linux security modules that got merged over the years. And um, the current state of the art is that they are not combinable. So usually what you have is your host system has applied a SA Linux security profile or an App Armor, App Armor security profile, which also means that your container will have an SA Linux or App Armor profile applied to it. That's usually what, uh, what people do. Um, so everyone kind of knows, I guess, how they work. It's mandatory access control in addition to discretionary access control. So after the DAC permission checks in the kernel, for example, opening a file set, this is fine. You're allowed to open it. You then have uh, the um, Linux security modules, which can get or get called, and they get another say, are you uh, uh, allowed to open this file? Um, so I guess there is the difference be between authoritative and restrictive uh, security modules. So they are on top of DAC. They are not. They can't override DAC, for example. Recent discussion about this. Interesting enough. <clears throat> but yeah. So uh, they're pretty important. There is a bunch more. There's Mac probably, uh, and we have two newer ones, which are kind of exciting. Uh, one is Landlock, uh, developed by a, a colleague at mine at uh, uh, Microsoft, incidentally. Well, actually, way before that, but he's now with me at Microsoft. And uh, Landlock is a completely unprivileged um, LSM, uh, which you can use nowadays, more or less, to replace AppArmor. I don't know if it's uh, a complete feature parity, but the idea is uh, certainly there. And I think it's a more modern and more elegant design um, around a set of uh, system calls. So um, this is a very uh, cool idea, in my opinion, and can be leveraged for, uh, for containers and currently isn't just because it's very new technology. I don't know how many people have heard of Landlock before. A little bit, four or five, see? 
So, um, and the other one is the BPF LSM. Uh, well, how many people have heard of BPF? <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, the BPF LSM uh, allows user space to compile BPF programs that can attach to where it gets very technical, but uh, the way this is works that in the kernel we have security hooks, which is literally like a, a for loop and that goes through all of the registered security modules. Like capability is one security module, the next one is for example SL Linux, and then you could also call a BPF LSM hook because that's technically uh, stackable. And uh, the way this, so you could attach a BPF program to a specific uh, LSM hook, for example, when opening a file, and then inspect the arguments that that hook gets passed and make decision based on this. And it's actually pretty, uh, pretty powerful um, uh, mechanism. Uh, it has a, we use it in some uh, contexts related to this, to, for example, restrict access to only a specific set of mounts um, in. Uh, in the unprivileged mounting code that uh, we currently have done in, uh, that Leonard has done in um, systemd. So it's a very powerful feature. I'm very excited about this. And I think we haven't really uh, exhausted all of the uh, possibilities that come with uh, BPF LSM hooks, but it, it is uh, uh, pretty nice. I use it quite often, um, actually. Um, and it's much more dynamic than SA Linux profiles or App Armor profiles. You don't get into relabeling issues and so on that you need to do. You can just replace the BPF program. So um, that's, it's not really new, but it's, uh, I guess, also not very much used outside of the big cloud providers. That's at least the impression that I get, but it's definitely something um, uh, to explore because it's much more fine-grained. Um, but obviously also only available uh, to privileged users. So you need a privileged process to hook that BPF program up for your container. You, the container can't just do it uh, by itself. And last but not least, we finally get the ability in, um, I guess, the last kernel release or last two kernel releases to block the creation of uh, username spaces. So username spaces never had an LSM hook in them. And there was strong resistance to that, but uh, it's, it also meant that because uh, user namespaces are unprivileged to unprivileged users that you could just call unshare dash dash user dash dash map root uh, and then you could mount tempfs you could mount overlay fs and so on as an un fully unprivileged user on your system which is obviously it's kind of neat on the one hand on the other hand it's a huge attack surface and there are a lot of workloads that might not want to give this exposure uh, to unprivileged users and they had no way of actually restricting that, which is why all distributions carried a patch for and disabling unprivileged user namespaces. Uh, it's the same syscuttle sys patch that exists for 10, 15 years, I think. And now we finally have at least an LSM hook where you can say, and it will probably be the major use case, if this request comes from an unprivileged user, so not from root, then I'm able to refuse the creation of user namespaces while still allowing the creation of user namespaces by privileged users. So I'm pretty excited that this finally uh, went in because there was uh, for sure missing um, functionality. And I think BPF Landlock and this new uh, user NS hook is more or less the most recent additions that we had in the LSM world that is exciting for um, containers. Yeah, and I mean, the, the ability to turn off the, the user namespace is also kind of interesting, even if you don't do it just globally for all users, like the, the ability to do it per process um, through, the, through those LSM hooks will be quite interesting because that was kind of the main issue with the, the syscattle. So it's, it's, it was an all or nothing system-wide knob. Um, which is not always ideal. Uh, there's definitely cases where like, do you want your web server to be able to create a user namespace? Probably not. Um, but do you want your users in group so-and-so to be able to create user namespaces? Maybe. Um, and now with that hook, we've got that kind of flexibility. Uh, whereas in the past, your only real options there were to probably play with SecComp, uh, which I'm gonna get into very shortly. Uh, but SecComp has some limitations, especially when we look at some of the new uh, system calls like Clone 3, um, which uses a struct uh, with a bunch of pointers and fun stuff instead of a simple um, integer arguments, making it impossible to, to validate through SecComp. And so making, it, making that kind of approach effectively impossible, short of completely turning off uh, all of the new clone syscalls. So speaking of SecComp, so, um, SecComp is not quite an LSM, even though it's often very, very close to LSMs. It's effectively um, a way to process um, 
apply, apply policies on system calls right at the entry point of system calls in the Linux kernel. Uh, that was historically used to just build simple profiles uh, saying this, but like this system calls allowed, this one is not. That got extended a bit um, to support BPF, not eBPF, but BPF. Um, to also be able to evaluate arguments and then based on those arguments make a decision whether to just reject it, keep going, uh, or um, like lower, log to audit. There were a few other targets that you can use. Yeah. Um, one of the things that was added somewhat recently, I keep saying somewhat recently, but it's been quite a few years now, but still recent for many people. And is you can just make it into the kernel and then 10 years later you get your first bug reports from user space. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So it was probably what, like five or six years now that we've been working on this stuff. But um, so there's a, few, there's a new target, uh, again, new, um, called Notify, which allows for if a pattern, uh, if a BPF pattern matches, instead of just allowing it or rejecting it, instead sending it, sending a notification through an FD to a user space monitoring process that can then decide what to do. And that process then gets to send back the response, uh, being like, you know, continue or reject. And if you reject, what error and stuff do you want to send back? Um, this is quite interesting because it allows for a more privileged process on the host system to process all of those um, seccom requests effectively. And then it lets you go even one step further and have that privileged process then perform the action on behalf of the calling program and just return the, the final return value back. So effectively never letting the kernel directly process the request, but just hijacking it and doing it in user space. Um, this is quite interesting uh, for container managers that primarily work with unprivileged containers because it lets us fake whatever the hell we want pretty much. Um, we've used it for things like the mount syscall, so we can allow um, some mounts that are normally not allowed instead of a user namespace, we can now go and do it. Uh, we've done it for things like the sysinfo system call to look at things um, like the container resource limits, like the C groups, and then update the value of the sysinfo syscall to include those values directly. Uh, we've used it to allow make nodes, to allow set exada, to allow a whole bunch of different things inside of contain unprivileged containers, which would not normally be safe. But if that goes through a privileged process that can look at policy and can make a more educated um, decision as far as what's safe and what's not, it might be acceptable. Although it is, I consider it to be a stopgap measure to give containers the impression that uh, they're not subject to the limitations that they're actually subject to in a way. So, uh, for example, just specifically the, the mounting thing that we do, it's very complex to do safely and to do uh, correctly. So this is a don't try this at home kind of warning, I guess. Right. And uh, it's, it, it just expresses the notion, it just tells us that we are lacking the current appropriate mechanism that we would want in the kernel, but we're getting to this uh, uh, later. Yeah, and there are definitely a bunch of cases where, I mean, yeah, we want the user namespace to be mostly behaving like a full Linux system with everything that you can do. But at the same time, because it's running as a non-root user, you don't want that user to be able to like grant itself higher process priority than it has normally or any of that kind of stuff for giving itself more capabilities than it normally should have. But there are then a set of cases that we consider to be safe that this lets us work around. I mean, uh, if I have one minute to get philosophical about this. I think the difference is that we, that the way namespaces were uh, architected, the way that we thought this could work originally, or the author originally worked, is if you create a user namespace, and then everything that you're allowed to do should be done from inside of that uh, namespace, and the kernels should basically vouch for the safety operation that you're doing, and that's the only thing that you're uh, allowed to do. But the problem really is, that it doesn't necessarily scale. So in a lot of situations, I guess device node creation is a good tiny example where allowing it unconditionally in containers doesn't work. Allowing it for 20, I don't know, the subset of uh, make not calls, it would actually be safe. And you can't really express this in if you have this notion of um, everything needs to be performed inside from that specific namespace in, in other hands. In other words, you don't ever ask for rights to do something. Uh, the kernel is just always granting a, a global yes or no to this specific operation that you're trying to do. And this usually doesn't scale. Second was a way to get around this because you're implicitly asking uh, 
a, a container manager for uh, yeah for the rights to perform this specific operation. But we really should get away from this notion. Yeah, we should really get away from this notion uh, that it always needs to be the kernel that vouchsafes for this. Like it's way nicer if you can call out to user space and ask them, is this operation safe to perform? I think this is a nicer mechanism, especially for stuff like mounting. And uh, but it's a different design. All right. Yeah, and as it turns out, we need to deal with like 30 years of existing stuff, which is a bit of a problem. Um, all right, I'm going to kind of pick up the pace because we only have about 10 minutes left. So let's go. Um, just a quick demo of what you can do. Um, so I still have that one container here running. Uh, I'm going to pass it a block device. If I go in there and we format that block device, there you go, and we try to mount this stuff, this is not going to work. That's good. That's the default behavior. Uh, with interception, we can actually say, actually intercept uh, mount on this container. Also, ext4 is not trusted. This is a terrible idea from a security point of view, but it works. Um, now, if you wanted to make this a bit safer, uh, one thing we can do is install Fuse2FS, which is a user space implementation of ext. And then we can do some magic. In this case, we're going to tell lext to now intercept any attempt at mounting ext4, and instead of running the real thing, just Give it to Fuse. And uh, that works. And if we go look at the mount, we can see fuse.ext4 is the file system here uh, instead of um, instead of real ext4. So that's one way we can intercept things and actually redirect them to something that's safe because this is just a process now running inside the container. There's nothing running outside of it. That's fine. Um, so that's that's pretty powerful. We're all just reinventing up calls for containers, I think. Uh, two minutes. This is an exciting new feature that I apparently have to talk about in two minutes. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and I want to point out, use uh, 30 seconds of the two minutes to point out that uh, we don't even have man pages for this yet, um, apart from some system calls. So the new mount API um, is a way to split the single mount system call that we had called mount into multiple system calls. Uh, and make it completely FD based, which is just so much nicer. You should use FDs for everything uh, because they provide a stable handle. And uh, the mount system call, the original mount system calls had various limitations. Like for example, you couldn't mount uh, cross mount namespaces. So you couldn't just say, take this mount and mount it into this uh, container because the kernel would just be like, no, this doesn't work. This is, you know, I just have this single system call and I, you need to be located in a namespace that you're mounting it to. So this doesn't really work. But the new mount API has a split where you can create an opaque handle, uh, a mount FD, and then you can set mount options on this. You can do this in one namespace, completely privileged if you wanted to. So mount an XFS, uh, XFS file system, set options on it, create the super block, um, and then you have an FS mount FD, which refers to a, to a mount, but it's detached. And detached means you can't reach it from anywhere in the file system. It's really just a handle on a mount that is not alive anywhere. It doesn't belong to any main, uh, namespace. So, but that means you can switch into a new mount namespace and then issue a new system call called move mount in this case and attach it into this container. So in a way, it's really nice because you can actually now inject mounts into a container, something which we are making a lot of use, uh, use of already. And uh, there was a talk about this at another conference, uh, how this can be uh, leveraged. So there is delegation built into the new uh, mount API. And this concept of having detached mounts that don't appear in the file system is something that has been sorely lacking on, uh, on Linux. Usually people would do this by attaching a mount, opening it, keeping a file descriptor, and then unmounting it again. And this is sort of the same concept without this dance. And without that, so without that amount ever having belonged to a specific namespace or being owned by a specific user namespace. So this is really, uh, really uh, powerful uh, to use. And as part of the new mount API, we also made it possible uh, to create what we call ID map mounts. And that is essentially just a way uh, to change the ownership uh, of a whole 
directory tree or just a single file, whatever you want, uh, on a specific mount. So you mount the file system, every ID is owned by UID 0, and then you say, at this mount point, I want all files that are owned by UID 0 to be owned by UID 1000. Then you can actually express this uh, notion. This is powerful for containers, it's interesting for containers, but it's also interesting, for example, in systemd, this is used to say, on this specific mount, only UID 1000 can write. Like if UID 0 tries to write to this mount, this ID isn't mapped, so you can't write anything to disk. It also gives you the ability to make UID mappings that user namespaces rely on completely transitory. Uh, meaning you never persist the ID mapping that a container uses onto disk. So that means every time you start a container, you could randomize, you could randomize the uh, uh, ID map for that container because there are no files on disk that belong just to the ID mapping of the previous container. So that's pretty good. And what we really want to do in the future, and that's what I talked about, we want to be able uh, to do delegated mounting so that if a container calls mount, uh, via the new mount API inside of uh, a specific mount namespace, then I can register myself. The process can register itself as the mount handler for that specific mount namespace and then get notifications about mounts and make decisions on whether or not they are allowed. So a properly designed delegation mechanism that doesn't rely on seccomp. All right, I'm gonna do the shortest demo ever of this. Um, so just if I go inside of the container again, um, I've actually been using this all along, so if we look at, I guess, ZFS, um, we'll see that the root of this container is uh, using ZFS, and there is a flag here. You see read, write, real time, ID mapped. So it means that the data mapping is in place, um, and even though my process tree is running as like 100,000, if I go look at, ZFS obviously isn't upstream. This is an upstream feature, but the ZFS yeah. folks have very quickly They've turned it on. onto this. Yeah. Uh, so if I go look at, oh yeah, ZFS, never mind. I can't easily show you, but the, the, the file tree on disk would be owned, um, like would be effectively unmapped. There is no, you wouldn't see any 1 million UID on there. You would just see zero because that's the ID map we've got loaded in place. All right, very, very briefly, because we're very rapidly running out of time. Uh, so C group two, uh, C group and what's going on there. Um, we're still moving to C group V2 uh, overall. Like we've been saying that for a decade, I think at this point. Um, distros have by and large been doing the move now to C group two. Most stable distros are on C group two. There's still a few gaps here and there. Net CLS, net prio being kind of two controllers that are somewhat missing. You can do equivalence with NFT in some cases, but there's still a bunch of user space that doesn't know how to do that, and it's a bit problematic. A um, bunch of memory pressure stuff was added, which is really nice, uh, effectively getting that PSI value for like how much memory pressure you're dealing with and letting you deal with that uh, with demons like UMD and some others uh, to, to take action before the kernel goes and just starts killing stuff. Um, so that's pretty nice. Uh, there's also now support for um, Z-Swap devices uh, as far as limits directly in the C group tree. I noticed that recently, which is pretty nice. And as I mentioned, uh, hybrid systems are a bit of a problem. We've got user space tools that literally set up C group V1 on top of C group V2 and just cause all kind of problems. Uh, so that's the kind of fun we're dealing with and we're hopefully gonna get rid of soonish. Um, just kind of conclusions. So usual reminder, get off privileged containers, please. That's the thing we keep kind of saying, but you know, user namespace has been around for well over a decade at this point. It's really best to start using that because a lot of the new kernel container, fe kernel container features are not going to be available if you're not using a user namespace. So even if you want to run uh, things privileged, create a user namespace, put a privileged map in place, use that, but you need to get on onto that. Uh, more and more helpers are get, becoming available uh, to handle mediated resources, uh, doing kind of resource mediation for unprivileged container um, to just give you that tiny bit of extra privilege when you need it and not constantly like with a privileged container. So that's pretty interesting. It can work in different ways, either through second interception where the workload doesn't need any kind of awareness of what's going on or with more advanced kind of APIs where the workload does need to know that it needs to hit like either like a Unix, Unix socket API or some other kind of service to get um, something privileged happening. And we've got a full minute, so you get to say a few more words if you want. <laughs> um, 
No, I think that's it. We <laughs> should really uh, uh, open up for uh, questions. Yeah, if there's like one question in the room, it's probably about as many as we can take. Mm. Yes. Thank you for the talk. Um, so with SecComp Notify and your work there, you're able to kind of leave the kernel and send a message over to, mm -hmm. to user space and it waits. Uh, with the eBPF LSM, is there any hope that a similar mechanism could be implemented? Because currently there's no way to await user space um, and it kind of very much limits the, uh, the use case of eBPF LSM. You, you, this is, a, is it basically a question whether or not SecComp will support eBPF. Or well, no, it's more, it's more like the, if you use the eBPF um, LSM and you want, like, something hits it, like being able to ask user space for what, whether to continue or not. Uh, I mean, currently, I think the closest you can do to that is by using BPF maps. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can actually have a BPF map that is being populated by user space with some rules that's then accessed from the eBPF program. But that's not really a notification so much as like a way to dynamically change the response of your program. Um, I've got a feeling that people wouldn't really like an LSM hook that straight up goes to ask user space. Would mean the LSM hook would block on user space, yes. right? Yeah, it's always a bit of a tricky one. I mean, it was tricky when we suggested it for SecComp as well. So you should ask the eBPF people. They're <laughs> open to all sorts of crazy ideas. I'm joking. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I really don't know. It's, uh, it, it would be kind of problematic because security hooks um, are caused from security hooks in a way are layer, uh, always a layering violation because they appear all across the VFS stack or whatever. And I get why it is done that way. I don't necessarily like it, but fine. And so they can be called in, in pretty interesting contexts. Like for example, you could suddenly block in the decache or something. I don't think this would be a good idea. Um, allow listing specific hooks. I don't know if this is feasible and it's, it's really something that the LSM people should uh, um, should answer. I, I mean, you also expose yourself to very interesting loops yeah, for I obvious reasons. Um, wouldn't be a fan of it. Yeah, because LSM is one of the few that is sleepable. Mm -hmm. uh, mainly that's only for reading from user space memory at this point, but I guess just to add that, I mean, the, the BPF LSM was sold as not actually being a security enforcement measure, right? It was a monitoring sort of thing, which would, uh -huh. I think, add further opposition to that. Um, of course, things go beyond what they're sold for. I think if you want that capability, implement a separate defer to user space LSM that you can stack. Mm -hmm. And that allowed the idea to be evaluated on its own merits um, without BPF or any other sorts of baggage with it. Yeah. Be my I, guess. I think Christian can correct me if I'm wrong on that one. But for what I remember, one of the issue of the LSMs is that you can't make them as like easily as an out of tree module, right? You need they need to be within the kernel tree. I don't think you can easily have one completely on the side. Uh, I really don't know. And yeah, since there was some complexity there, which makes it slightly harder to just come up with your own pet LSM to just kind of ship on the side as like a DKMS module or something. Um, I seem to remember that you effectively need it to be in your kernel tree, which then means you need to actually roll your own kernels, which is fine for a lot of people, but... Yeah, LSMs are not runtime loadable, so... Mm, okay. Cool. Yeah, sure. It's kind of more general. Uh, if we assume security in the kernel, this is all predicated on the kernel getting it right. So, mm -hmm. and the safest bet is always to assume security is only temporary in the kernel. Someone will find something eventually. So no one gets it. Always, time. there's always. So you have to be nimble. Uh, with like SGX going away, Intel's going away from it, except from the Xeon and stuff like that. And ARM's got some. Is there any silicon substrate uh, help? here that you can imagine, even theoretical, like is, uh, there's all sorts of side channel attacks and stuff. I mean, as long as you can keep people away from the physical machine. Is there any hope here for actual security? I it's, mean, it's pretty <laughs> tricky, right? Like we, we it's something that uh, I know Canonical looked at a while back and was trying to, to 
to come up with something. And the short answer was like, we never really managed to even talk, like we talked with a lot of the Silicon vendors and yeah, cool, they've got some really nice security features, but they all kind of depend on it not being a single kernel that does everything. Um, like if you're dealing with virtual machines, you can do a lot of interesting things, whether it's like AMD SCV or those kind of features. But when you're dealing with a single kernel, it becomes a bit trickier. Um, I, I mean, I know that IBM was doing some amount of research on- I think, Yeah, but I, but I think for me this becomes, a, this becomes a work Workload, uh, sort of a workload question in the sense that, so there's scatter containers and all that kind of stuff where you suddenly really blur the distinction between a, try to blur the distinction between a, a container and a virtual machine to which I would always say, does it have a separate kernel? Then it's a virtual machine, end of discussion, it's not a container. So I think if you really need, for example, you would never, I would assume that you would never say, I'm running a bunch of unprivileged containers and I'm giving this out to customers uh, on the same machine, uh, untrusted customers. But because that's really not, in my opinion at least, you, you might have different opinions here, but that's at least not the use case that I see because you're making promises that you can actually hold, in my opinion. But if you own, for example, your cloud or machine, or this is a, a workload in a sense that you con uh, control that is untrusted, um, and you just want like extreme density, then that's the case when I think unprivileged containers make a lot of sense, especially when combined with the pressure, pressure stall uh, information um, that uh, C Group provides. Because one, it's not just a thing of isolating user IDs and privilege and so on. Uh, it's also a matter of can a container guarantee the resource constraints that you want to have, like memory constraints, CPU constraints, and so on. And uh, nowadays we're in much better shape thanks to Secret V2 because it's a lot more strict. So these guarantees can be given and we know of companies that uh, run such workloads. But if it's untrusted machines you're giving out uh, to users and that need to be isolated from each other, especially if it's not the same, sorry, customer, then you will always use virtual machines. So I'm, my question basically is, what sense does it make to implement hardware silicon features specifically for containers when what you really want is a virtual machine? And think about making virtual machines better and faster. But it's uh, containers, in a sense, are crucial to, for example, to user space uh, services. Like if you have systemd services uh, and you have thousands and ten thousands of them, you want to sandbox them as finely as possible. You want to resource constrain as much as possible. That's a word. That's absolutely use case where you don't suddenly want all of your systemd resources run in separate virtual machines. I'm pretty sure someone would now interject and would say, no, that's exactly what we want. But once we are performant enough to actually do this, maybe, sure. I think we're gonna have to vacate the room for the, for the next talk. Um, but yeah, like I, I would usually agree that you know, for tenant separation, VMs do pretty well. Then container, containers work really well in, inside of such an environment after that. And if you, depending on how much you care about security, you can go with multi-layer with like, okay, well, your actual workload run it as an unprivileged user inside of the unprivileged container put maybe an LSM around it, put maybe a second profile around it, then do the same thing on the container itself uh, and make sure everything is kept up to date. And the likelihood of all of those going wrong at the, at the same time are gonna become extremely unlikely uh, to the point where you're effectively safe or safe enough. Like there's no such thing as being safe in this world, but safe enough. Um, thank you, we're still gonna be around if there's any question outside, um, but we need to, to leave the room.